And finally, the government has proposed a ban of smartphones in schools. With 97% of kids in the UK owning a smartphone by the age of 12, is this a realistic policy? And what about the calls for the government to go further and ban smartphones more generally? Joining me to discuss is Conservative MP Miriam Cates and Head Teacher Catherine Burbell Singh. That's it for this week. Once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of the video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Thank you again for watching and do join us again next week. Miriam, as of this week, schools are being given new guidance about limiting the use of mobile phones. How is this different to what was happening before? Well, I don't think the guidance is statutory, so it won't necessarily change anything overnight. But I do think it gives a clear signal that uh, phones are not welcome in classrooms. The government thinks they're a bad idea. Clearly, there are some schools that are doing a good job of this. They are keeping phones out of classrooms. But there are lots of schools where they either don't have effective policies or those policies are being breached a lot of the time. So this guidance is not going to change the world, but I think it does give cover to heads who very much want to have a phone-free school and hopefully moves us in the direction to start to realise that phones, smartphones, social media are not suitable, not safe for children. They're a big distraction from learning, but more than that, they're actually changing childhood for the worse. And Catherine, on that, of course, uh, you run a very successful school. Is this guidance going to change your day-to-day -day working life at all? Well, it won't change anything for us because it's already the case that we don't have phones in our classrooms or in the school at all. But um, I do think it should help uh, those head teachers who are very keen on getting uh, phones outside of their schools um, and haven't necessarily had the backing of parents or of, um, well, just the general culture in the, in the country. Um, having said that, uh, I don't think that this guidance goes far enough. This is just about phones in schools. And the problem that all children struggle with and all families struggle with is that these phones take over their lives. You know, they leave school. You will find that they can be on the phone for eight hours every day. And you wonder, well, how is that possible? If you, don't, you leave school at four o'clock, how are you doing that? They're up until two in the morning. They're on the phones all of the time, accessing the most horrible, worrying stuff that affects their mental health, makes them deeply unhappy, uh, stops them from learning, doing their homework, spending time with family and so on. And... Um, I really would want government to, to ban phones and social media for children under the age of 16. And I do want to talk about that very, very shortly, but just before we do, Catherine, I just wondered how much, if we're just thinking about the classroom in terms of this specific policy, um, obviously you're not seeing it in your classroom um, given the ban, but how much of an issue do you think it is in terms of pupils using phones at school generally? I think it's massive. So I think the... I think even in schools where uh, where the official policy is uh, for schools to be for, for phones to be banned, um, you never know what's going on in various classrooms. And sometimes some teachers, because they have difficulty controlling the class, they'll let the kids go on the phones because well, if the if the naughty kids are are on the phones, it keeps them quiet. You see. So they let them put the earphones on and they let them listen to music and it just means a bit of an easier life. And I don't think we can underestimate just how much that's happening across the country in our classrooms, while at the same time, we claim that the schools have banned the phones. And, and it could be very much that the head believes that the phones are banned, but that actually what's happening in classrooms is that those phones are coming out because it makes the lives of teachers a little bit easier. And Miriam, to go to Catherine's previous point, which is about uh, whether this goes far enough, um, I'm guessing you are also in her camp and saying, actually, things could go a lot further in terms of general smartphone use in children. Yes, absolutely. And I think Catherine said it before, other head teachers have said this, even if you don't have phones in school, a lot of the problems in schools with bullying and uh, the children falling out and, and much worse than that are being caused by social media by the kind of materials that they're looking at outside of school. So even if you could say, never again will there be a smartphone in a school, these problems wouldn't stop exactly because of the reasons that, that Catherine said. And I think we've got to deal with the practical reality here. It's all very well saying, you know, so heads should keep phones out of schools and some effectively do. But think about this, these phones cost over a thousand pounds, some of them. Children are very reluctant to hand them over and will hide them so they don't have to. 
parents often don't want the child to hand over the phone. Now, I know of a primary school where kids hide their phones in their coat pockets so they can keep checking their notifications throughout the day. Are we really expecting a head teacher in a school with 2,000 pupils to search every child before they go in? That's realistically what we're talking about. Now, there may be some schools where they can do that, but there's a lot where they can't. And that's why the issue actually is that children have these smartphones at all, that we've allowed them to become addicted to them and the content that's on them. And unless you take them out of childhood altogether, it's going to be very difficult to create an effective policy in all but a handful of schools. And that's why I think, and I know, it, you know Catherine has a similar point of view, that actually social media and smartphones are not safe for children at all. And I think the, the data is increasingly showing that, whether you look at suicide, self-harm, pornography, that's a massive issue. We're now seeing child-on-child -child sexual assaults, children copying what they've seen on porn. Now, none of this material should be seen by children at school or at home. And that's why there seems to be a growing consensus, not just amongst some politicians, but actually parents of, of children who've been victims to this, uh, people in the media who just think enough's enough. You know, childhood is being ruined by these devices. Let's go back to an offline childhood. People don't realize if you're not with children day in, day out, you don't see the damage that's being done. In fact, even at our school, we're super strict. We don't have phones. It's, um, you know, the best environment that you would find in a school for no phones. And yet I, there's a boy I just had a conversation with. He's in year 11. He's got his exams in a few weeks. Um, he, he needs to do X, Y and Z today. He didn't want to do it. And I was saying, just give me your phone because he needs to give me his phone. And I said, just give it to me. You have my word. You will have it back at the end of the day. You just hand it over to me. He said, no, I just, he just wouldn't let go of it. He, he, he just can't let go of it because he's so addicted to it. It's like a safety blanket. And um, the thing is, is that the, the addiction, I've seen children cry saying, I'm so addicted. I don't know what to do. Can somebody please help me? And the problem is, is that you warn parents as teachers, we warn parents before and they don't necessarily listen because they think, oh, come on, Miss Verbal Singh's just being a bit too strict or she's being a bit silly. And then three years later, they come to me and they say, I don't know what to do. My child's involved in criminal activity. My, my girl has met a 25-year-old man and is talking to him and I don't know how to get, him, get her away from him. Um, they come and say, tell me they're, they're watching these horrible videos or they're involved in the kind of chat which is so... Uh, it, it is so shocking, the, the, the language that they use, the stuff that they, they, they might talk about. They talk about raping babies and, and, and they see this sort of thing. They, they, this is what they're seeing. It, it changes who they are. And parents who then do listen and take the phones away from their children. So they've given them the phone. Child has had the phone for a couple of years. They take the phone away. What the parents always say is, I've got my boy back. He's back to being his lovely, innocent self. But because if, if you're the only person, this is why I welcome the guidance about schools, but I wish it went further than this. If you're a head teacher trying to make these arguments to parents, the parents sort of think, oh, you're just a bit loopy. You know, you just seem a bit extreme in the things that you're saying. And I'm saying, you've got to believe me. I've seen this happen. If you were to talk to my kids who are 15, 16, you'll see it. And their child who's 11 who seems quite, he's very sweet because he's, he's still 11 years old. He's in year seven. He's, his phone isn't such a big deal at that point. The parents cannot imagine what's going to happen over the years. And then by the time they realize it, it's too late. That, that is the big problem. Miriam, how would a smartphone ban actually work in practice? Um, because obviously it's all very well to say, oh, they're dangerous. Um, they have all these problems. If you look at what's happened to children of overuse, some children going on uh, paths they wouldn't have otherwise. But are we talking about um, an age limit on smartphones, just as you have of alcohol? Um, are we talking about uh, something where you have more enforced age limits on social media, uh, on the dark web, not that you can really have it there? Um, how would you see it actually working? Well, I think we need a multi-pronged approach. So first of all, on the social media, it, it should be possible to have an age limit of 16. We currently have an age limit of 13. That's not kept to at the moment, but the Online Safety Act, in theory, when it's fully operational, will impose severe penalties on social media firms for allowing under 13s on, onto their platforms. I don't see why that couldn't be raised to under 60s. It's certainly legislatively possible. Uh, and I do think that's possible. So that's one angle. In terms of the smartphone ban, do you have an age limit? Do you have a, a prohibition on sale? 
that does need more work, unquestionably, from politicians, from lawyers. But I think really we've got to get to the place where the majority of policymakers, uh, public intellectuals, educationalists agree that we should be banning these devices. And I think it's really interesting to look at the attitude we've taken to tech over the last 10 or 15 years, which is so less unfair compared to anything else, drugs, alcohol, um, you know, even allowing children into playgrounds. You look at the kind of safety features that there are in playgrounds. It's absurd how physically safe we now keep our children. And yet we've almost said, oh, they'll be fine on tech. We can't stifle the tech company's creativity. We can't get in the way of their market share. I mean, it's absurd when you think about the kind of harms that have been done to children. And this is what we've got to do first. We've got to convince politicians and policymakers that actually we shouldn't be giving the tech companies a free pass here. We shouldn't be saying that, yes, of course, kids are fine on their phone. We've got to agree that they're not. That's the first step. Then we can talk about, well, practically, legislatively, what does it look like to have a ban? How do we get people to uh, to adhere to that? How do we win hearts and minds? Let's be, on let's be honest, because we've got to convince parents and to some extent uh, young people that this is uh, in their long-term best interests. Yeah. The, the thing to remember is that uh, Steve Jobs, uh, in 2010, when a journalist asked him about iPads and his kids, he said, obviously, I'm not giving iPads to my kids. That would be crazy. Um, Bill Gates wouldn't allow data to his children on their phones until they were 16. Uh, all of the big tech guys in California who fly around on private jets, thanks to the money that we are spending on smartphones and apps and so on for our children, we are funding their very nice lifestyles while they protect their own children from this stuff. And they really do. They understand the damage that it's doing. And when I think about my poor families in Wembley, ordinary families in the inner city who save up all their money to give their child a birthday present, which is actually going to destroy their children's lives in order to make these fat cats even richer. And while they protect their own children, it makes me so angry. The fact is we ban all sorts of things for children. It's not, we, we don't, they don't have just access to drugs, for instance, or, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. They can't, um, it, you know, a parent needs to decide that. Alcohol, uh, sex, marriage, um, driving, uh, smoking. There are so many things that we ban from them. And we ban them because we understand that children are not mature enough and able to make the right decisions when it comes to these things. The, 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 the mental health problems that uh, happen thanks to these phones are just, they've exploded. Jonathan Haidt in America, a psychologist and writer, fantastic on this. Uh, Jean Twingy, again, she's written books about this. There are all kinds of studies that have been done about this. I see it anecdotally, and that's just mental health. Then there is the learning that they can do. I can tell you anecdotally, my kids in the top set don't have phones because we convince our parents not to give their children phones. And the vast majority of children in the top set do not own a phone at all. And I can tell you, all of my bottom sets have phones. Not only do they have phones, but they're on their phones for six to eight hours a day. So any parents who are listening, honestly, if you care about what kind of grades your children are going to get at GCSE and A-level, don't give them a phone. And Catherine, just picking up on what you were saying there about how you have plenty of, you know, banned things for children, uh, drugs, alcohol. Would you put smartphones on a par with illegal drugs? Yes. In fact, the thing about, uh, you know, smoking some hashish is that you smoke it and then that's it. With a phone, you get immediately addicted. You're then you ruin your life with that. Honestly, when I say you ruin your life, look. There are some people who will be listening to this thinking, oh, isn't that a bit of an exaggeration? My child had a phone and they were okay. You can survive it, right? Just like you can survive smoking drugs. And you'll be, you know, there are people who smoke drugs and they just partake in it a little bit and it's a bit, it's recreational and it's okay. But the fact is, there is a huge addiction problem there. And for children who are a little bit more vulnerable, who are special needs, who are easily, they're more followers instead of leaders, um, who are easily taken in by the, the nonsense that happens online, like, and that frankly is the majority of children, you might have an exceptional child and you might be a parent who has managed it and it's been okay. But it's got worse and worse. Since the, the invention of TikTok, for instance, people don't know. Like, so if you had a child, and who's now 18, you don't know what it is to have survived TikTok. 
it, it becomes something, it, it, it destroys their attention span. So they're unable to read a book properly because you need to have an imagination and the ability to be able to read something and it slowly process in your brain. Whereas if you're used to 15 second clips and then moving to the next one, moving to the next one, and there's some explosion, there's some kind of funny thing that makes you laugh, that then becomes your go-to and your expectation of what life should be like. And you literally are just breaking your children's brains. And Miriam, just finally, I suppose the counter to this, and I think um, you got involved with a little bit of a debate on this on social media regarding a Times column this week, is, well, actually, smartphones, uh, it's not as though adults are you know, immune to the vices that come with smartphones. Uh, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. All this stuff exists. It's going to be really hard to limit it. One child's always going to be able to get access to it and show their friends. So perhaps it's better to em embrace it rather than trying to ban things now. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. And I think that's because for exactly the reason as Catherine said, we, we accept as a society that there are certain freedoms that children just can't have because they're not capable of using them safely. So alcohol is the obvious thing. Of course, adults should be able to drink. Does that mean some will abuse it and some will cause themselves up? Yes, it does. But the majority of adults are able to control that behavior to use alcohol in a, you know, in a safe way and enjoy it and benefit from it. But we wouldn't suggest that a child aged 11 could walk into a pub or a supermarket and buy alcohol because they don't have the maturity to be able to regulate their behaviour. They're much more susceptible to peer pressure in terms of taking risks and things like that. We just accept that a child's brain is not developed enough to use that particular freedom safety safely and therefore they can't have it. And I think that's exactly the same with smartphones. They're just too addictive. Now, of course, we have to bring children up knowing how to use the internet safely, how to use you know the basic tools of word processing and things like that safely. But we're not arguing that we shouldn't be doing that. And of course, children will need to access to desktop computers and things like that, of course. But that's entirely different to having the internet in your pocket 24 hours a day and that addictive factor and also the private nature of it. We've not even touched on the fact that these phones have cameras that they can stream video. Um, I think for the first time last year, the majority of child sexual abuse images of seven to 10 year olds that the Internet Watch Foundation found online were self-generated. That means children aged seven to 10 filming their own sexual abuse live on the Internet for groomers. Now, that's because it's private and you've got a, a camera and you can do it anywhere behind a closed door. Those are the kind of features of a smartphone that are inappropriate for children, but we're not saying you can't use a desktop computer to word process an essay. You know, there's a difference in the level of harm. So I just don't think there is any safe level of smartphone use for a child, and that's why we need regulation. But that's an entirely different thing to say that all phones are bad, all internet's bad, you know, there aren't benefits to things. There are, but you have to be an adult to know how to use that safely, or try, because many of us are addicted to our phones, let's be honest. Yes. So Miriam, for parents watching now who are perhaps worried about um, you know, the ch their children being on smartphones, uh, perhaps after this discussion and the various issues raised, is your advice and Catherine, uh, perhaps yours too, to get a Nokia 3210 for your child, um, that type of phone if you want to keep in touch with them but don't want them uh, exposed to these various things? Well, I am one of those parents. I have teenagers. And I think for, sometimes you read people in, uh, let's say, more libertarian publications saying this is just the parents' fault. But the pressure on a child, on a parent, to, if you're the only teenager in your class without a smartphone, you do not have a social life. And that's why we need, we need action from government. Yes, of course, parents are partners. Of course, schools are partners. Absolutely. But this is why we need regulation. Imagine if you sent your child to school every day, knowing that there were class A drugs all over the desk, but said to your child, no, don't take them, don't take them, don't take them. How many parents are going to be successful? That's the situation we're in. So I would just say to parents, I sympathise. It's terrible. It's awful. That's why we do need some help. I mean, we actually sell those brick phones at school and I sell them at a loss. We make a loss at the school so that we subsidize because I know it's the number one thing that will help a child to get them on a brick phone instead of a smartphone. And I explain this to the parents and a number of the parents do then understand. And we do get the highest progress eight, uh, in terms of results. We've done so for the last two years uh, in the country. Uh, I will absolutely stand by the fact that I think one of the reasons why we manage that is because some of our kids do not have phones at all. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for joining Spectator TV.